Good morning, everybody. What are we here for today? Uh, I had the honor of uh, being invited to this hospital to teach meditation and the use of meditation. In Zen, we teach something we call clear mind. This clear mind is present right here, right now, at every moment. And uh, this is something we can access. And the question, especially in this place, is if our mind is not clear, why? Why do we have problems? Why do we have attachments? Why do we have mental disorders? And for that, we need to have a basic understanding of the body and mind concept in Zen Buddhism. When we are born, the relationship between body and mind is fixed for life. Like the driver in the car, the mind is in the body for life. What happened before we don't discuss, there are many ways of looking at it, what happens before you're born, but it's not our concern right now. What is important is to see how body and mind work together, what is body, what is mind, and what is it, this clear mind, that perceives both. So, the body has five senses, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and touch. The mind has various faculties. One important faculty is cognition. That CPU, that cognitive machine, is processing my talk right now. Trying to put my concepts together with your concepts. Trying to analyze what you understand and what you don't. The next is distinguishing or sometimes discriminating consciousness. And that is very important, not just because of our judgments, but that's where we can tell right from wrong. That's where we tell me from not me. And the next one and the last one in this order is your memory. What you remember. In fact, we remember very little compared to what we know. And if you line up these eight, the first five physical senses, and then conceptual thinking, discriminative thinking, retrieval thinking. These pretty much cover of what we are and how we function as a sentient being. Now, we humans have a special faculty, which is not included in the eight. We have the ability to perceive all this, to reflect on this, to change this. And when we lose this ability, temporarily, I have to add, then all kinds of problems appear. All kinds of attachments, false identifications, and if the symptoms persist, mental disorder. My teacher, the late Zen master Sung San, used to say, in this world, everybody is a little crazy. Little bit attached to something, little crazy. More attached, more crazy. Completely attached, completely crazy. That was his way of, you know, presenting how your consciousness works. So, if your seventh consciousness has a false identity or multiple identity or the wrong identity, you cannot fit into society. That disorder is treated here and in other institutions. If your CPU, if your cognition has a malfunction and you cannot think, you cannot process, you cannot output information, that also has to be treated because you cannot fit into society. If you remember too little or too much, that's also part of the disorderly functions and then that has to be treated too. The question is, what do you treat that with? How do you administer the medicine? Do we really see the cause and the cure. So, for that we need to go into the concept of I, or what we think of ourselves as an ego in the West. Until very recently, if you look at any Vienna school of psychology and later on ways of psychiatry, the notion of the ego was fixed. You're born with it, you die with it, the notion of self is pretty much permanent, but the elements can change. 
You can change what you remember, you can change what you think, you can change what you feel, but the notion of self is pretty much there, like the image of God which is absolute. I'm not bringing theology here, I just want to indicate how much we are conditioned by our thousands of years of past views on the transcendental and the observable. And the notion of the ego, the notion of the self can be fixed, patched up, but it cannot be taken away, not in the West, not until recently, not until we started to import some of the Oriental thought. Now, in the Orient, the view of the self is different. It's something that we create. The notion of the ego, your self-image, is something that is combined together by the function of these eight levels of consciousness and sensations that I have just outlined. This self-image is what you think you are, but it's not what you truly are. And the difference between your true nature, your true self, and your self-image, your personality, your ego, the bigger the difference, the bigger the suffering is. If this difference exceeds certain socially acceptable values or thresholds, you are considered mentally ill. If you are within a threshold, you are considered normal. And if these two are very, very close or overlapping, then you are considered better than average. So what is it that really determines your self-image? It's the way your seventh consciousness, your discriminative consciousness works. So you and the tea that you drink, are they the same or are they different? At this point you can say different, the tea is in the cup, I'm sitting here. But watch this. Now try to answer the question. The tea that I just drank and me, are they the same or are they different? Now you can say it's the same because it's in my body. It became me, my fluid system. But in the break, at 9.20, I may go out to this very small room with a man's sign in it, and it becomes different again. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> so in this sense, if you open your aperture wide enough, the distinction, the ultimate distinction between you and the world gets a little bit blurred. And we need to go beyond these conceptual distinctions and we need to find something substantial. Now, what is the substance? I mentioned clarity or this clear perceptive mind right at the beginning. And the oriental view is that when you look at the sentient being, what you see here, taste, smell, touch, think, feel, say, act, remember. None of this is you, but it's coming from you. You have the freedom to exert all this, to produce all this, and you have the responsibility to endure and face the consequences. But ultimately, none of this is your true self. None of this is your true nature. Why is this so important and sometimes paradoxical? At least for the Western mind, it's really paradoxical. Because how could we attain freedom from our own anger, desire and ignorance if we were the same as that? We are not, but we make it. And if uh, we are not responsible, how could we be correct human beings? How could we actually do something for each other if we do not recognize our own responsibility? The Orient actually has freedom and responsibility totally combined. In the West, many times we have this infantile notion of freedom. I do whatever I want, that's my freedom. Okay? Now later on comes the adult view when the consequences come and you have to actually overlap the two together. When we are free from our own wrong views, it means we can transcend or could transcend our dualistic consciousness. This dualism is born in your discriminating mind. This dualism is created by our own instincts of survival, possession and procreation. Originally it's not there. Originally we are totally and absolutely clear that when you make something all these appear. In fact ultimately life and death as a cycle they also appear. And I'm not asking you to believe this. 
I'm putting this before you as a working concept. And this concept can actually work in your everyday life as you want to keep yourself strong and clear. And it can work even in your uh, professional career as you look at a patient right before you. So you know that your human nature and the patient's human nature is exactly the same. But none of the karma is the same. You are the doctor, he or she is the patient. None of the content of the eight levels of consciousness is the same. Because they have their memories, you have yours. They have their distinctions, you have yours, etc., etc. But the humanity, the human nature that binds us together as a species, as a kind of mentally identical homo sapiens sapiens, that basic nature is the same. That is the basis of our compassion towards them. Without that, lasting cure is impossible. So, every day you face a lot of tasks and a lot of problems. How do you become free from them at night or in the morning? How do you prepare? I truly believe that if there is a meditation practice which helps you become totally free and clear from this, then it will make you a better doctor. It will make you more professional. It's not just about learning something new, not just putting something into your, into your cabinet as the next batch of learning. If it goes deep enough, it has a transformational effect in yourself as well as in the profession that you do. Let me give you a metaphor. Everybody likes chocolate, most of us. Whether it's dark or light, with raisins, with nuts, any kind of chocolate, a little sweet, jazzes you up, gives you some pleasure, we're fine with that. But no matter how many kinds of chocolate you taste, you do not have access to its root. So the origin of the chocolate is the chocolate factory. Now the factory is not tasty. The factory is something you cannot eat. The factory is made of metal and stone and wood and plastic and all those things. But without that, there is no chocolate. I'm saying this because everybody wants some kind of extra, something sweet from meditation, some happiness right away, some balance right away. But if you don't get to the factory, which is not sweet, if you don't clean the factory floor, which is not clean, if you don't know how to handle the machines, you cannot manufacture chocolate. In other words, you have to become aware of yourself and do your own homework inside and face your own karma which you never wanted to face in order to make a lasting difference and not just put on a nice layer onto the existing personality that you have. Your own transformation helps transform the world around you. Your own clarity helps the world become clear around you. And you have the exceptional position to do this due to your profession since you are dealing with people's minds directly, legally. In a licensed and insured way, you deal with people's consciousness in the most responsible manner that is possible. So for that, we have to be prepared and we have to be adequate. And many times we feel our own in inadequacy because you see the symptoms, but you don't seem to get to the core or to the root of it. So many times the symptoms are treated, but the illness remains there. Like, it's very unfortunate that anybody on uh, uh, sedatives, antidepressants, uh, they cannot do meditation effectively. Because the chemical boundaries that keep the person's mind safe is actually the limit to the enhanced experience of your personality or your subconscious during meditation. During meditation, you try to transcend the limits of your own self-image, what you think you are, but in fact, it's only like 5 to 10% of what you're carrying in your karmic backpack. So to actually access that and process that, you need something you call your basic freedom of the mind. Now, if the mind is already afflicted and needs to take these, these medications, then until these medications are dropped because there is some improvement in the patient's condition, it is very dangerous and sometimes directly harmful to practice meditation because you close one door with the other hand and you open another door with the other hand 
and then there is many times confusion. As a basic rule, anybody who receives psychiatric care cannot enter meditation without the doctor's explicit approval. Meditation is not a substitute for psychiatric treatment. In the best cases, it can supplement or complement that just when the cure or the kind of healthy state is in plain sight and the medications can be dropped. And that's where the Western doctor and the meditation teacher have to be on the same page. They have to cooperate very, I should say, in a broad you know, bandwidth, in a wide range, so as to give the proper cure. Mistakes can be made that are taking years to correct. And that those years are spent from the life of the patient. I think I have given a, a kind of brief and multi-level introductory. And I would like to hear your questions before we move on to meditation instructions. And before I take your questions, first, I would like to hear you out what you're interested in, what your questions are, and I'm trying to answer them to the best of my abilities. The next phase will be, I'll be giving meditation instructions first with moving meditation, how you move your energy around, and how you remove the blocks that may accumulate during your life. Cognitive blocks, speech, and emotional blocks as well. And the other uh, stage will be, probably after the break, I'll teach you sitting meditation and put, of course, the sitting meditation itself into the right context because uh, the worst possible mistake with an oriental or any kind of systematic teaching is if you take elements out of context because you think I don't need this, 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 but I need that. Then the context is lost, the relationship is breached, and then you receive something which you think of as essential, but actually it is already distorted because you want something from it. You want something which in its original context would have been possible, but since it was extracted, uh, it starts to function differently. And sitting meditation is one of the victims of kind of extraction policies in the West. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for a very inspiring introduction. Um, I'm a therapist of young children. And I would like to... I can't hear you, I'm, I'm sorry. a therapist of young children, very young children. Yes. And I would like to ask from which age is meditation possible or open as a tool for a helping or, or a broadening the capacity of cure? The children I'm working with are from, let's say, three years to seven or eight. Thank you very much. Uh, the way we teach formal meditation uh, is not suitable for children of uh, such a young age. I suggest games. Games that focus the attention, games that enhance cooperation, and games that ha have the hidden quality of increasing mindfulness. These are not mind games yet. They are too young for that. It's kinetics, it's movement, it's uh, interaction with each other, with objects. And later on, with my short foray into the theater realm, I can say that uh, children have this fantastic ability to uh, instinctive role playing. In fact, what we're doing as adults is also a role play, but we take it very seriously. Children are much more lighthearted about it. So first, just games and then little role playing, then you can, you can have a cohesive thing like a children's drama theater, and then the pedagogy can go into dramatic pedagogy, which is like a, almost like a group therapy later. But uh, in terms of sitting, I had uh, children who were nine years old, and one of them sat in full lotus next to me for half an hour. But she wasn't meditating. She was thinking about me and mother and uh, other people who she loved. And then when it was over, she asked, oh, was I doing good? I said, sweetie, you were doing great. Your body wasn't moving but your mind was. And with a nine-year-old, you cannot ask that the mind wouldn't move. They don't understand. So meditation needs a certain amount of experience in life. And if that experience is present, then the seeds fall to the right place and the flowers will bloom. 
And uh, there are many what we call outer paths, not inside Zen, but outside of Zen, uh, where you can practice meditation with great success and you don't even notice it. One of that is sports. You do jogging, you do many kinds of sports, and it takes your mind off the current routine because you are preoccupied with the body. It's something really elementary, it's really important. So if you don't do sitting meditation, then do some moving meditation. And uh, you don't have to be a workaholic to like work. And if you like work, you can have sometimes work with your hands and not work with your mind. So uh, with children, I always say you cannot really teach them what you want. You can teach them what they're interested in. So in that sense, their line of questioning is giving you a very, very good path because their interest is the opening. Where you want to go may find closed doors. But no matter how irrelevant these questions may seem, start with their questions, start with their interests, and then you can do the kinetic part in game form, theater form, or sports, or in whatever way you can. And uh, most of the results you won't see. You won't see it between age three and seven, but when they become adolescents, you will. That's when we start to change. The hormones kick in. We become uh, young men, young women, okay? So that's when these seeds start to bear fruit. Before that, you can see something, but very little. Thank you. Uh, you said something about attachment. Yeah. And uh, the way we are free from attachment, mm -hmm. we're getting back to ourselves. Yes. Uh, one of the contradictions that I can't live with up to today is that in Western psychology, attachment is very important. Actually, people with no attachment are very sick people. Yeah. And when you go to Zen Buddhism or some kind of other, other philoso philosophies uh, of, the, of the East, uh, we ask people to give up their attachments, sometimes to give up their names, to give up their connection to the families. Yes. In the Osho beliefs, you have to erase everything in your past and so on. So something between having attachment and not having attachment is not clear to me. Okay. Uh, because uh, my thinking is still a Western thinking that attachment is very important and good thing to have. Okay. So, Professor, thank you very much for your wonderful question. And I have to say that these teachings where they only point one way, like a linear path to non-attachment, and that's the end of the horizon. These views do not come full circle. Let me give you a story to all of you. Uh, in Chinese Mahayana, there is the equivalent of Santa Claus. His name is Ho Tai. It's a monk with big belly. And there are many children hanging from his ears, his head, etc. He has a big backpack. The backpack is always full of gifts. He's, he's, a, he's wonderful, you know. He's the happy monk the non-ascetic monk, who is under the tree, enjoying the sunshine, but he's enlightened. So what does this really mean? And how, did, how is this relevant and helpful? <coughs> there was a young monk going up to the mountain, trying to do a 100-day solo retreat. He had his provisions, he had his determination, but he also had his doubts. He was young and inexperienced. And Hotei was coming down from the mountain with his huge backpack. And the young monk says, Oh, oh, Hwasang, wonderful to meet you. What an honor. Uh, he says, Yeah, hello, how can I help you? He says, I'm going on a 100-day retreat. My mind is still not really clear about that. How should I practice? And immediately, Hote just lets go of his huge bag, and that thumb drops on the, on the road. The monk perceives this, and he's very happy. He says, wow, thank you, thank you very much. But after this, after this, what should I do? Then Hote grabs his backpack, puts it back on his back, and walks off the mountain. So to expand on this a little bit, uh, you're not required at all to be a nameless, uh, someone without relationships, a kind of non-person or a non-identity, which is very dangerous. It's a loose cannon. It can go anywhere, anytime. But perceive your true nature, which is without any identifications, without any attachments, and then reintegrate into society at the level that you consciously choose. 
There's a big difference between conditioned, being conditioned from childhood to be someone over which you didn't have any control. And then you say, okay, let me get rid of all these attachments, identifications, self-image, the problems that go along with it, also the merits that come along with it. And let me make the slate super clear. And then I consciously build it up from zero. Now that rebuilding, most of the time is not there. Why? Because in the Orient, especially in the monastic path, you become part of the monastic family. You become part of a hierarchy. You have a spiritual father. There are several supporters in motherly positions. So these relationships do not disappear. They just transform from flesh and blood family into a monastic family. So that's why in the Orient, when you look at these teachings, you do not find a reintegration policy or a personal rebuilding or reinvention policy, how you recreate yourself. In the West, it's a problem. I agree. But then, the other part of Zen teaching, especially the way my late master, Zen Master Sung San, presented it, that when you attain this clear mind, then perceiving your true situation, correct relationship, and adequate function is not a problem. So that sentence goes for the reintegrated person, or the person with practicing life in everyday life. Because you don't have to, especially as a lay person, you don't have to go to the desert for a year. Not even for 40 days. Just come for a retreat, then you stop being professor or doctor or friends of the hospital manager. For a while, you stop being that. You don't even talk. You just do meditation together with others. You put the, your backpack down. You kind of relax a little bit, mentally and physically massage yourself, get refreshed. And when the retreat is over, you take your bag again, put it on your shoulder. And then with a refreshed mind and body, you carry your responsibilities forward as before. I mean, if you look at your own culture prevalent here, Shabbat was about that. Once a week, you put your backpack down. Once a week, you switch everything off. Once a week for a day, you only deal with your spiritual or religious life and the community you are integrated into, your family, your neighborhood, your friends, your associates, even your enemies or people you dislike, but they go to the same synagogue. I should say that this kind of culture, if it's taken to the extreme, it can cause some worries and fears. What happens if I look like this? But I found my relationship again, in fact, it never really disappeared, but again in a new culture, in my monastic family. And uh, I should say I'm more exposed to human life than before. I'm not kind of tied and bound by my old conditions. They didn't disappear, but I had the chance to go beyond them and to consciously build up a life which I believe in, which I want to carry forward. So I hope this answers your question. Uh, you, you were talking about clear mind, mm -hmm. uh, but meditation, uh, it's a big word for a lot of all kinds of practices. Mm -hmm. And some of the practicing are talking about a quiet mind, more like being more balanced or uh, have less uh, anxiety. Mm -hmm. And uh, is this also contraindication for people with mental health? No. Problems? If you advertise quiet mind, you fail. You can have insight, you can have perception, and then that kind of experience helps you manage yourself better. But it will not be quiet. There will be thoughts, emotions, and everything buzzing around. But if you do meditation correctly, you establish mind space. And this mind space, A, it's clarity and reflection. B, it gives you decision-making power. If I see someone coming from the door, I have about 15 seconds to decide, shake hands or not. If the person appears right here next to me, I have zero latency, no time. So many times with our minds, we don't see our own impulses. We don't see our willpower. We don't see our reaction. And especially in the West, especially with afflicted minds, the reactive consciousness is the biggest problem. They react in adverse ways, in extreme ways, in unpredictable ways. So this unpredictability, this adversity can only be handled 
if the mind space is expanded and the mind mirror is cleared up, because then you see it before you act it out, before you say it, before you actually cognitively put more emphasis into it. You see your first impulses and then you have a choice, follow them or not. If you have the correct notion of what you think you are versus what you truly are, you don't have this deeply rooted in instinct to follow that because that's what you think you are. And if you don't follow that, you know what happens to you? Nothing. You just don't follow your karma. So the correct notion of karma as the building blocks of your personality, that's really helpful and I think very important. Quiet mind, it has deep, deep literature, especially in China, in Sung Dynasty China, where Buddhism was very established. That's where Pure Land Buddhism is from also. That's a later phenomenon. Where you teach millions, you don't have time always to explain in depth. So you give one important word and you let them figure it out. Like Pure Land with Amitabha Buddha. It's the total absolute equivalent of heaven with a God in it. The attributes are different, but the notion is exactly the same. It had nothing to do with the original teaching of Shakyamuni Buddha or the Zen patriarchs for 28, 30 generations. After that, it started to be popular, started to be interesting, started to be widely accepted, and then these derivatives began to appear. These notions, at first, they seem to be helpful, but later on they become a hindrance. Easy to understand, but almost impossible to achieve. If you do a 90-day retreat without any mental problems, maybe, maybe in the third month you experience some quiet mind. But until then, you have your roller coaster. You're sitting on your own kind of karmic roller coaster going up and down. You have a good day, you have a bad day. Sometimes you want to get up, sometimes not. Sometimes you love the people around you. Sometimes you hate them and they don't even talk to you. And you don't talk to them. So then you see your projections. These projections never stop unless your mind stops. So when you can direct all your energy back here to your Tanjon or Tantian in Chinese, then the function of these upper centers also become different. Quiet mind is a good word, but it's at best a byproduct of mature practice for a limited period of time, especially in lay life. Okay? Yeah, you had quiet mind for 20 minutes in the morning, then your three children start to bang at the door. Give me food, take me to school. Where's your quiet mind then? Let me talk about energy and information. So our consciousness, we believe, has thoughts, emotions, speech. When that happens, that you, you notice the elements in your consciousness, many times you forget that there is energy behind it. It's like you have the GPS coordinates in your car, you have the map, but sometimes you just do not have a notion of the fuel tank. And you take it for granted that it's there, that it's kind of the infinite you know, supply of energy. We do not have an infinite supply of energy, that's why we are impermanent and that's why we die. If we always had the energy we needed, our bodies would never get old. Okay? So, where you have energy, you have information. It's the two sides of the same coin. And where, where you have information, you also have energy. Vice versa, this is true. This is a translation of the old teaching in Buddhism that form is emptiness, emptiness is form. I'm translating this into Western language and Western understanding because one of the biggest problems with the form is emptiness, emptiness is form, that people fall into nihilism. They believe emptiness is nothing. Well, something cannot come out of nothing. But the moment this word emptiness enters the mind, we have more problems than merits. So, for your information, since some of you have been exposed to Buddhist teachings, the original word for emptiness is shunyata in Sanskrit which is not just emptiness. That's how scholars translated it. It says empty fullness or complete emptiness. So complete and empty together and empty and complete together. Whichever way you look, okay? 
But the Western conceptual language descriptors like English and German, they cannot express these two in one word. It would be too long, too unnatural. But the West never really thought of zero or nothing. Rather, there's a potentiality, a potential state and an actual state. A state of mind before thinking and then doing the actual thinking. Before feelings and then exposed to feelings or creating feelings. I'm saying this so as to give you the right idea what you can do in your mind, how you can completely clear yourself of any karma, any attachment, any identification, and then become complete. And then live your life completely fully. When you wash your car, the car is not worried about the dirt that comes off. When you clear your mind, don't worry about the karma that you lose. You are still complete, okay? So, why I'm saying this about energy? Uh, first of all, energy is an overused and sometimes abused word in the New Age. Many people have many attributes to this and it became this rosy term of something mystical or something special. I just invite you to experience energy in your mind and body as it is. I don't want to make any special layer on top of it. Zen leads you to an experience, in fact a series of experiences, and not define you. Zen does not define you who you think you are or who you truly are. The way is yours to walk. So for that, the correct notion of energy is important. If you look at these upper centers in the body, when you think too much, you have a cognitive overload, it hurts here or anywhere in your cranium. When you don't say what you want to say, and you say what you don't want to say, you can have this choking feeling in your throat. It's too much speech karma, okay? Inadequate speech. Uh, when you have uh, heart problems, which is not due to bad food or other physiological symptoms, when it's just psychosomatic, then emotions actually weigh too much up here. That's what we call primary emotional center. The secondary is here. And men understand it if they worry too much. By the time they turn 45, 50, they can develop ulcer. It's here. This is all various kinds of chocolate, as I mentioned before. But this point is the factory. So the Manipura chakra in Sanskrit, or Tantian in Chinese, Tanjon in Korean, Tandan in Japanese, if you go into that. This is the place where we have not differentiated our energy into these various forms of products. Lower than this is our physical differentiation. That's how babies appear. That's also an important human function. But what's even more important than these physical and mental differentiations is the state before these dualities appear, before these phenomena appear. And what's wonderful about us human beings is that we can attain this state. We can get to this clear mind before any appearances, before any mental phenomena, before any identification, before any notion of good and bad, before any notion of past, present and future. All these qualities that I have just mentioned are created up here in the, our upper centers. In this chakra, in the navel chakra, we focus our energy and we focus our breath and we focus our mind too. And when you do that, these upper centers are relieved. Because when you change the energy, you change the information. Remember that? If you don't change the energy, you have a hard time dealing with the information. You have 10,000 emails to check, text messages to read, phone calls to make, feelings to feel, thoughts to think. So in Zen we say you, you do not treat the tree just at the branches and the leaves, you treat the tree at the root. This is the root. These are the leaves. When it comes to meditation in Zen, the basic technique is really not making anything special. Many people want enlightenment experience at the end of a seventh day course like that, or a three day course, or a 10 day course, and you pay for it, so you're supposed to get it. It doesn't work like that. 
the root, especially the most important parts of the root, are not visible. They are below ground. So if you do not explore that part in yourself, which you have never seen, you cannot get to that root. Okay? That's why in meditation you see the rough stuff first. There are many, many methods that give you this nice and rosy uh, happiness feeling. Imagine this, hear that, switch on this music, think like that, make an image, etc., etc. We call these object-oriented meditation and they don't last long. Okay? It's like uh, cognitive sugar. And sometimes you need it because you're bruised, you're traumatized, you're rattled, you're in disorder. But this does not get you to the root. It's just some silver lining around the cloud. And Zen means you ask the question which opens your mind. And you keep that question until all your traffic disappears. And this question is, what is this? That is, what sees with my eyes? What is it that hears with my ears, feels with my skin, thinks with my mind, feels with my heart? What is that? So do you direct that question inside to the very root of our being. And then if you go deeper and deeper and deeper, you attain something. I cannot tell you what it is. I can only point the way there. Okay? But what is clear, if you have a correct teacher, is that when you go the wrong way and you think you got it, the good teacher immediately opens your hand and says, okay, look at this. Did this appear? Yes. Then it will also disappear. Then this is not what we are looking for. So please let go of that. And then return to your empty hand. Return to the practice and do the clean up a little more. Just day in, day out, one after the other. And I know people want quick results and this is a very stressful and haphazard world in many respects. But that doesn't mean that your practice has to be. If you want quick results, you remain superficial. I'm sorry. If you experienced enough problems and traumas inside and outside, you know you have to go deeper. You know you have to have the essence, something which is more than just the surface. And lastly, before I open it up to maybe more questions if you have, in Buddhism, especially in Korean Zen, we have four Bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas are enlightened beings representing certain mind qualities. I'm bringing them in here so as to show you how skillful Mahayana is. First of all, we have Avalokiteshvara. She is the Bodhisattva of compassion. Then we have Manjushri. He is the Bodhisattva of wisdom. Then we have Kshitigarbha, who is the Bodhisattva of speech and the correct path. So, making the correct commitment and walking on the correct path. And then we have Samantabhadra, who is the Bodhisattva of action, correct conscious action. Now, I have been, you know, reciting the names of these wonderful Bodhisattvas for years before I asked the question, why? Why these four? Why not more or less? Or why not just Shakyamuni Buddha and then let's get on with it, okay? And the answer is something really simple. We have thoughts, we have speech, we have feelings, we have actions. If these four are not pointing to the same direction, our personality can disintegrate. And this disintegrated personality is one of the root causes for mental disorder. Your thinking goes this way, your speech goes that way, your actions go a third way and your feelings are everywhere. How do we treat that? How do we actually put this into correct perspective? First of all, you consciously project these qualities into these figures of enlightened beings. You externalize them. You purify them. You put them to the same direction like the way of enlightenment. And then, when that's clear for your mind, for your whole being, you, you internalize them again. And then you know, you created this with your own mind, but you have done the job. You have made it articulate, you have made it clear, you reflected on them. You saw all your feelings, 
your thoughts, your actions, and your speech as your own creation. And then you internalize that again. They become instinctive and subconscious again. And you can do a much better job in your everyday life than just speech unexamined and unexplored, actions unperceived, feelings <laughs> inarticulate, and you have lots of suppressed emotions, and then thoughts that are still in chaos and in disorder. Recently, that's the last 20, 30 years, especially in the United States, there have been many efforts to combine Oriental thought and Western discipline, like Western medicine. And personally, I've seen both sides of, of the coin. I've seen the Western approach, I've seen the Oriental approach. And from the bottom of my heart, I wish that this bridge would become stronger and bigger. But it doesn't work without you. It doesn't work without your personal commitment or personal experience. And when you make that commitment, especially towards yourself, towards transforming yourself to a better person, a better doctor, a better father, mother, etc. That commitment actually starts to work. And without that, you cannot just put another layer of discipline onto the existing agent, the existing person that you are. I'm saying this because only you can do this. There's no teacher that can give you this transformation. We can give you the tools, we can point out the way, but if you're not into it, it's not going to happen, okay? Any questions you may have? I wanted you to uh, explain a little bit about the meaning of karma is not because like energy, it is being too much used Absolutely. and abused in the Western it's not world. Like karma is in the names of cafes and biscuits and coffee and exactly. whatnot. To our notion in Zen, karma is cause and effect. The accumulation of cause and effect through repetition becomes habit. Habit, through identification, becomes a personality trait. And these habits and personality traits assemble into a person, a personality. Now, there is this mind which I mentioned earlier, which is perceiving everything. Many times we confuse ourselves, our identity, with this person that is assembled from these repetitions, habits, and various identities. If this mass of karma is broken, then due to the attachment, the consciousness is also broken. If you stop being identified with your karma, you become free from personality disorders eventually, not right away. That's why you need the treatment. You cannot teach non-identification to somebody traumatized. Even for healthy people, it's difficult. If healthy people remain functional after experiencing some suffering, so their integrity, personal integrity at this point, is not broken, but they already experience something from the outside or from the inside, something that is not usual, something that is not in the comfort zone of their own person, then they can try to go beyond this karma and detach from it, become free from it, see how it's created, and then create something else. But karma itself doesn't exist. We create it with our mind. We create it through these four channels, and we store it in the eighth consciousness, make good and bad out of it in the seventh consciousness, label it, analyze it, make some matrix out of it in the sixth consciousness, and the first five senses, you know, the first five levels of consciousness, they are the input and output ports where we interact with the world and each other. Karma is neither personal nor impersonal. That's really important. If you make it personal, it becomes personal. You remove the personal aspect, remains just material. So we have karmas that are instantly bringing results. Like I drink, water hydrates me, instant effect. I see the cause, I see the effect. Next one, which comes back to you in this lifetime. And you may or may not remember it. 
but you started it and then in one year, in a decade, in two decades, in half a century, it has fruition. And then the next type is something that started in your previous life, but it has results in this one. Why you were born into the family you were born into, the condition that you were born into, more specifically the body that you were born into. In Oriental belief, and some experience confirms that as well, your previous incarnation pretty much determined uh, your current one. And what you do now will predetermine the next. So this is very important to see if you want to have the correct scope, the correct view of karma and what's going on. The next one is when you see the result in a future life. It's corresponding to the other one. Previous life, next life. And that's where your subconscious comes out as a very, very important tool. Why? From all your previous lives, you store your identity in your subconscious. You only have a personality notion of this life. And that's healthy. Imagine you would remember by default who you were before, and before, and before, and then at a weak moment you wouldn't be able to choose. That's the root of schizophrenia. Okay? So that's also broken personality into pieces from this lifetime, not just previous life you know, problems. But if you start to meditate, then that meditation necessarily leads you back to previous experiences which you are carrying, you're not aware of, and they determine you as archetypes or memories, whatever subconscious drivers you experience. So if you stop being identified with that, then you can let go of these karmas, and then you can leave the chocolate where it is and return to the factory to produce something else. So karma is all this, but I want to bring in something which is equally important. It's called Dharma. So Dharma is the law that describes and governs the function of karma. So we are not in some world where we cannot see how things work, how our minds operate, how our body and mind are connected. There are laws that govern that. It's called the Dharma. And the phenomena are called the karma. If we are conscious and humans are conscious to whatever extent, we are conscious. Then you can perceive the Dharma which controls the karma. At first, we want to be in control. But by the time you turn 35, 40, you know, maybe sooner, that you cannot be 100% in control. In fact, as you get older, you see you're less and less in control. Yet there is something which you can perceive and work with. That's the law how cause and effect operate. That's the Dharma. So here in this place, the patients carry very heavy mental karma. And the discipline that you use to approach that is your medical profession. The degree that you got, the education that you received, and the experience you have with the patients. Uh, to what extent can you go beyond that? I'm not asking you not to use it, but to what extent can you expand it or go beyond it and see both yourself and the patient from a different or new perspective? And that new perspective can only come from you, from inside. And that's one of the aspects where meditation can help you. And let me briefly talk to you about sitting meditation. Sitting meditation is part of a larger toolkit in the Eastern meditation culture. First they used bowing, and this bowing seems to be before statues, like Buddha statue or Bodhisattva statue. But as you heard in the first part, this is not some worship of an object. Uh, the Buddha and the Bodhisattvas remind, in fact personify the qualities we have inside. So when you raise your true nature above everything else, when you raise reality above anything else, 
Uh, that kind of mental work is helped by an externalization. And in that sense, any holy object is an external personification of something very precious inside. How cultures interpret that, that's another matter, and I don't go into that. But what is important to know is that in the Orient, especially in Mahayana countries, bowing practice is just as important as chanting mantras and sitting. And most monks who went into meditation, they did a lot of bowing and chanting first to take off most of their karma and then enter the seemingly quiet, but sometimes inside very tumultuous realm of sitting. So bowing is like breaking ice. Chanting, the mantras, primarily work with your heart, with your emotions. They are like boiling the cold water to the boiling point. From the icy cold water, it becomes almost steam. And that takes care of another layer or other aspect of your karma. And when you sit, sitting is like the wind which blows the clouds away. And I, I have to remind ourselves that most of what you learn now, although it appears in a Western, somewhat integrated form into this culture, was a monastic and oriental way of practicing until 40, 50 years ago. So it takes adaptation and assimilation so that this would work for you and for your beloved and for your friends and maybe for your patients. In the monastery, it was no problem if, if someone went a little crazy. It happened quite often. They had what they called the karmic wind, okay? And that wind just changed the person into something and someone that was not there before but since they looked at it different, it may not be there tomorrow. And the whole monastic structure was keeping that person basically in place. There was no isolation. There was no uh, judgment. There was no fear of uh, discrepancy or deviance. So then this person, as he was dealing with his karma, was given time and space to work it out, to let it go. And they were accepted at all the sessions, not sitting, but bowing and chanting, and they did a lot of work. And monasteries are still, to the present day, pretty simple. They, in Korea, no matter that they have internet, they still have a lot of physical labor. It's, it's wonderful. Sitting as it is, and no matter how much Western people want that, I wouldn't call it the first and most appropriate tool when you want to approach yourself. Your karma hits you in the face. Something that would normally go away by bowing and chanting immediately appears when you sit down. And you, then you wonder, how can people achieve peace like this? Or harmony? Or happiness? How does that really work? And uh, the answer is, it's part of a bigger toolkit. That's why I said at the very beginning, don't take it out of context. Don't take it out of the tradition. Rather, you enter the tradition, one or another tradition, and try to experience it fully. And when you do that, then you see how versatile the whole thing is, how adaptable it is. So I've, I, of course, don't teach bowing and chanting you know, in this country because it's not really compatible with the local culture, and we accept that. But we teach that correct approach which prevents you from being bruised or traumatized by the very technique which is supposed to relieve it. All right? That's important. When you just want the warm wind to break the ice, it's not going to work. So sitting will not take away your heaviest karma. You need to do something more, and that's why we do exercises, and eventually you need to really look at the tradition in its entirety so that you would get the entire toolkit. I have to say this because in this audience, nobody expects a miracle, but I still have to put some concepts to the right place so that you would see it where it is and not where you think it should be. If you have any questions about 
the current meditation session or in general about meditation, feel free to ask. I work in adolescent daycare unit and twice a week we try to do mindfulness meditation to the adolescents. It worked very nicely with the, with the staff twice a week. Then we moved to the adolescents and they found it a torturing experience. Yeah. Some of them has such an unquiet body, they couldn't sit still even for five minutes. Exactly. A similar answer as to your colleague before. People before they really want to have some perception inside, some kind of insight into who they are, they will not sit. They have too much energy, too much karma, give them something to, to play with, some sports, something that really tires them off physically, and then you have a brief window of attention. It's very special when somebody like a few children who were around in the families in, in Hungary and other countries, in America too, 9, 10, 12 year olds, they could sit like half an hour, but only for the sake of the parents or for me, because they had good emotional connection. But that wasn't real meditation. It was just a body posture they took. So with adolescents, uh, especially when they have so much energy, that energy needs to be utilized. You can't steal it. Uh, it takes time for those folks to get into human life a little deeper. Then they will have their own inquiries and they become more suitable for this. But even with adult patients, as I indicated earlier, uh, meditation opens a door which you sometimes don't want to open because what comes out of it, you cannot handle, let alone the patient. Uh, it's for your own benefit. You already understand how deep meditation can go, how much it can cleanse you from, from your own reactive consciousness, that you're not split into 2 and 4 and 8 and 16 and 32 and up to many zeros and ones by your own reactive mind. The hardest is when you feel yourself judging the patient instead of curing the patient. And when you're weak, when your mind is tired, then you can slip into that. Question. There are different instructions for, in meditation for your thoughts and when it comes through meditation. Can you give us please your uh, thinking about it, what to do or how do you uh, guide uh, during, during meditation with coming thoughts. You come back to this center, your mind returns to don't know or not knowing. And this don't know mind is clear like space, clear like a mirror. Then you let your thoughts come and go without any hindrance. In fact, your cognitive problems tend to resolve themselves better when you take yourself out of the active picture. And when you watch your thoughts, they can become very close or far, sometimes even a hiss in your ear. All that hiss in your ear, don't worry about it, it's just the data flow, that's all. We all have it. Anybody who uses mobile telephone and internet and extensive data exchange input and output, you have this sometimes ring in your ear or, the, or this hiss in your head. If you look inside, you find it. There's nothing wrong with it, except that this brain was not designed for so much data. It's too much, that's all. If you empty it out, the hiss disappears. And uh, if you look at it and if you go into it, then it's like a train. You can see the train as just one distant line of silver on the horizon. As you go closer, you can see the wagons, even closer the windows, even closer the faces behind the windows. So it's up to your resolution how far you want to go into it. And sometimes it's good just to let the train pass. And then things become more simple, more clear. Your thoughts can resolve themselves remarkably if you do not consciously touch them and you don't try to fix thinking with thinking. It's like trying to put out fire with gasoline. At the beginning of this day, uh you talked about uh, meditation in people with mental illness. Uh, do you think that moving meditation or Qigong can work better for people like this? Because it's uh, occupied the brain in the movement and maybe it's... Do you have experience with that? Moving meditation, yes, works way, way, way better. But even I would dissuade people from Qigong, something more simple and something that doesn't open up energy channels. Because if you open up energy channels, then the mental illness of the patient can drive that energy to the wrong place and make the illness worse. 
I'm sorry, the Qigong, you say it's better? No. Or no, it's a... I'm saying put them to some more simple movement that doesn't open up energy channels because when we do Qigong, we do that. And for the staff to clean up all that karma, all that junk that you have to deal with, it's important. It's like opening the doors, you air the room, the bad air goes out, then everything is okay in your own mind space. Not so with the patient. You cannot do that with patients. You open up the energy channels, then those who are a little bit crazy get more crazy, simply put. Okay? So, again, this is pretty much for you as doctors, therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, and not so much for your patients because I have uh, various experiences with people in various institutions, including rehabs, correctional institutions, hospitals, and to the temple, like I said earlier, we let people in with mild psychiatric symptoms who, are, who were still on medication. Like the, the trinity of antidepressants, sleeping pills, and sedatives uh, they cannot go together with deep meditation practice. I'm sorry to say, but these are incompatible. And I think it, it should be, to my conviction, should be part of anybody's working ethics to be super clear about this, because you can make things worse instead of improving them just because you want something new. It's something like a new tool. And in, in certain cases, it takes an awful lot of time and an awful lot of effort, and you have to work on yourself primarily before you can work on the patient. This is very important. Only by your own personal improvement, and I don't mean professional, I don't touch that. You have your degree, your postgrad courses, etc. But I mean your own mental improvement that you become more intuitive, less easy to provoke, less easy to, sli to slide into judgments, less easy to go into dualistic mind. If you develop these qualities, you become a better therapist, a better doctor. That's for sure. So if you work on yourself, you treat better. And then you don't get bruised so much by uh, dealing with your patients many hours a day, many weeks a year, and year after year after year. And that can take a toll on you. And it shouldn't. If your mind is clear, your energy is clear. <coughs> if your mind is not clear, your energy is also not clear. That's why if you're sensitive, somebody enters the room and you can already feel whether the person is in a good mood or bad mood, aggressive, passive, active, many kinds of stuff. This goes a long way. But I'm giving you this kind of perspective as an enhancement of your experience, not something that goes against your beliefs or convictions. You can go very far with this, and the more sensitive you are, the more directly you can perceive yourself and the patient. To the extent that you increase your own self-awareness, to that extent you can increase the perception of anyone and anything right in front of you. But if you don't do the internal work, you cannot do the external work. That's an equation, it's like EMC square. It's that simple. So the more you work on yourself, your mind, your energy, the better you can do your job outside with less traumas, less bruises, less breakdowns, less depletions, etc., etc., etc. It's not me talking now, it's my Western mind. Understood. Okay. Some people may say that actually it's working very nicely because you distract your mind. If I'm concentrated in doing these movements again and again, I can't think about my problems, my anxieties, so it distracts me. Like taking off your motorcycle back and forth is a kind of meditation and it distracts you from your thinking. It's true until you learn it. But when it becomes second nature because you have learned it, then you can actually do the movement and think several layers on top of it. So it's not necessary that uh, the physical movement would actually steal your mind only and only if you want that. So it's not automatic. At first, when you struggle with learning it, making it right, etc., etc., then it takes your mind off because you have to concentrate. The distraction is necessary. But once you learned it, people who learn sitting meditation and mantras and these sequences of movements, they can really testify after one or two years, ah, oh, the mind can multitask so much, there's no computer that can do it so well.
Okay? We are the super multitaskers. In fact, jumping from layer to layer several times in a second, we can do it so well. So it's up to you what you do with the exercise. Sometimes just focusing on your breath is enough. Sometimes the body movement is necessary. So there is no automatic outcome out of this. Moment to moment you need to decide and adjust yourself to your intention how you use these exercises. And right you are, when you move, your body movement actually focuses your mind and energy to that movement. And that's why we do it first. And sitting meditation, when you don't move, all your mind habits come out, screaming. But later, even the static position of sitting meditation can be so gently the object of your focus that you detach from these thoughts, detach from these emotional patterns, and you let them go. And they don't control you. You can control them. One of the biggest contradictions for human beings is that we create our thoughts, feelings, actions, and speech, yet these seem to control us. That's inappropriate. That's not to our standard. We should be better than that. All right? It's a wonderful question. Thank you. I would like to share with you um, a, a vision or maybe a dream. I have a dream to be a part that this institution maybe will, be a, will, will combine uh, in his uh, way of thinking and treatment some of um, maybe Buddhistic or the Zen knowledge and thought. And um, this is my dream and vision. Wonderful. Let's share that. Let's not remain just an isolated vision. The path is open. Israel, you know, is a very versatile culture and imports everything. So why not import this one? And perhaps uh, without any intent to kind of give you direct strategies for therapy, perhaps we can agree that if you want to fix your car, you have to get out of the car. You want to fix your karma, you have to detach from that karma. Nobody wants to be in the car when the wheels are changed or the oil or the engine is tuned up. But for, for that we have to have the correct notion of self. That you are not this body and you are not this soul, but you are something above that, transcending that, but creating these and being responsible for these, along with all the freedoms that we believe we have. So, if you do not identify with the problem, you can fix the problem. Then you can take responsibility for the outcome. If the painter has his or her face in the canvas, then the face gets painted all over, and we confuse that with the artwork many times. But what if we step back from the canvas, see what we are doing, and then pick up the brush again, and paint better colors, paint a different picture? So if you identify with your karma, you can't fix it. If you identify with your personality, you can't improve yourself. As contradictory as it may sound, I believe personally that a pretty large part of the healing process is the separation of the Dharma from the Karma, from your true nature, from your self-image, so that you could be truly who you are and work on this world that we create both inside and outside. So I hope from time to time we can meet again, share the Dharma again, and make a concerted effort to wake up to a higher state of consciousness and help more beings again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.